Luis Alvarez, I think, uh, if, if you took a survey of physicists, could probably win most votes uh, for being the greatest experimental physicist of the 20th century. Uh, his diversity of things that he worked on is just incredible. And I think one thing you may want to pay attention to, and a question that should be nagging you as you listen to this, and I don't just mean the young people, I mean the people my age, is how did he do it? That's really the question. I get that question from people all the time. How did he do it? How did he go from, uh, from, from, from making early Geiger counters to inventing and your bubble chamber to all those discoveries to figuring out what killed the dinosaurs to the Kennedy assassination to all these amazing things? It doesn't sound like one man. And that really will be the theme of my talk. Uh, the, the complexity of Louis Alvarez and the amazing diversity of things he did. And I think everyone here, if you just listen and try to figure out how he did it, I'll give my hints of what I think, but I think that's the most remarkable thing, are, are the, the, the incredible, the way he would get into a new project about which he knew nothing, like the dinosaurs, or the Kennedy assassination, or, or many things. He, he felt everything was on his menu, and he just picked... It's a combination of picking things that are both really important and actually doable. It's easy to find things that are really important. It's actually easy to find things that are doable. Getting that combination is the great trick, and I think he was the master of that. Uh, before I begin, though, I'm going to start with a little vignette. This is a little story that illustrates one aspect of Louis Alvarez that I think might not come out otherwise. Uh, and this is a story about the Monday night meetings that took place at his home over decades. It was actually a legacy of Lawrence. Uh, originally, th these things were started by Lawrence, but they'd be in his home, and he'd sit in the front, and, uh, and, and, and these things would, and, and would, would, would uh, be on different topics every week. But I remember, as a graduate student of, of Louis, uh, one of my last uh, first times there, I heard a talk by... Lena Galtieri, where, where did she go? Where are you, Lena? Oh, there, you are, right there, okay. And I was absolutely struck by this. It was characteristic of the way the Alvarez group worked. She was presenting her discovery of a new particle, called, we call it a resonance, and, how, and, and, and so I, I was looking forward to hearing about her discovery, and then for the first 35 minutes of her talk, she didn't talk about the discovery, she talked about all the evidence against it. And uh, how this evidence was this, but this, and so on. And, but it, so you do the cut here, and you pick this fiducial region, and you do this, and so on. And therefore, that isn't really evidence against it. Then she went into something else. And uh, uh, sort of two-thirds of the way through the talk, she finally got to the subject of why she had concluded this thing was real. And this was this sort of care. Uh, many of the members of the Alvarez group were here. Uh, who, were, who were there back at that time, remember this extraordinary time when somehow the Alvarez group was put together in such a way with such extraordinary care that it has probably made more important discoveries than any other group in the history of physics. And as far as I can tell, not one of them turned out to be something that had to be retracted. So there was a real care in the way that this was done. And that pervades everything. It's often not talked about. But a large part of this is and I learned this from Louis directly, but Lena was a good example of this. How do you go about proving yourself wrong in every possible way, and only when you fail do you then present the results, because if you failed, nobody else can prove you wrong, because you went at it so hard. And that was, that was the way he did things. And I was very fortunate in the beginning to be put in a special position, I, I worked my way in, where his new ideas, he would present them to me. And then he asked me to prove them wrong. And I got my greatest rewards from him when I succeeded. And if I couldn't prove him wrong, then he'd put it out to the Alvarez group. And if they couldn't prove him wrong, he might give a seminar on it. And if nobody could prove him wrong, then it got published. This was the original peer review system. So uh, let's move on. Now, Louis Alvarez, of course, missed out on the Nobel Prize. 1960, it was awarded to Don Glazer. He knew he had been nominated to share in it, and the Nobel Committee had turned him down. Uh, Louis told me on that day, the day that he lost the Nobel Prize, it was before I knew him, uh, that Clyde Wiegand sat down next to him. Clyde had been one of the principal scientists on the antiproton discovery, and Louis always felt that Clyde should have shared in that. 
And he said he never forgot this unspoken gesture of Clyde Wiegen. Uh, I was his graduate student uh, a few years later uh, when the announcement came that he had won the Nobel Prize. And uh, I, I've got to say, that was the most exciting moment in my life because I thought he had no chance. You know, many people, they know who's going to win the Nobel Prize. They're on the list. But Louis had missed out. And I, I just remember one morning uh, listening to the radio. I couldn't quite hear it. Nobel Prize, Alvarez. Blah, blah, blah. Ah! <laughs> That's all I heard were the words Nobel Prize and Alvarez. And I ran up, and there was partying for a week up at the lab with Louis supplying all the champagne. It was such a, such a great moment. Uh, here, here he is accepting uh, the Nobel Prize. He brought his group to Sweden with him. He felt so indebted to them. This is a younger picture of Alvarez. We tend to forget that these people were <laughs> one time younger. I was too. You'll see some younger pictures of me. It's with an ionization chamber he built. It's one of the first in the United States. It's like a Geiger counter, kind of a Geiger counter. Uh, he was always proud of the fact that he could build things in the shop better than any technician or machinist. In fact, one time he said, Rich, do you know how to throw a chainsaw? I said, I don't even know what you're talking about. He said, you don't spend enough time in the laboratory. Come on, let me show you. And we got this big, you know, the chainsaw. I thought he meant the whole chainsaw, but he just meant the saw. And, and he showed me how to hold it. And he said, if you flip it like this, bloop, 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 it rolls up into three parts, and you can hang it on the wall. So I, he, he taught me how to do it. I'd be happy to teach anyone here. <laughs> Another story. When I was new in his group, I was sitting in the office, uh, Bill Humphrey was my, I was working with Bill at that time, and I was working on calculations to figure out how to do things and so on. And Louis came by and said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm working on calculations, important calculations. Why aren't you over in the lab? I said, well, I'm working on important calculations. You should spend time in the lab. But I don't know how to do anything. He said, it doesn't matter. Go over there and stand around. <laughs> Once people see you standing around, eventually they'll hand you a screwdriver. And, uh, and, and then pretty soon you'll get involved. But you go over there, you need to work in the lab. So I did that. And about two months later, I was working. Bill probably remembers this. I had this $20,000 photo multiplier. I think it was $4,000 at the time, but it was $20,000 today's dollar. And I was working. I, whoop, boom, boom, bang, boom. I, I didn't know whether I would be kicked out of the group or what. I had just lost the equivalent of $20,000. A day later, I saw Louis. And Louis looked at me, held out his hand, and said, congratulations. I said, on what? He said, on breaking the tube. I said, what? <laughs> he said, the fact that they are letting you handle a $20,000 tube means you have succeeded in going over there and convincing them that you have good things to do. I'm really proud of you, Rich. <laughs> that was typical. He was trying to convey the legacy of Lawrence. In fact, in fact, I, I think he did. He considered Lawrence the greatest experimental physicist of the 20th century, but in fact, I believe it was Louis Alvarez. Before World War II, Louis introduced himself, he told me, as a chemist. This is a picture of Louis with his uh, colleague and <clears throat> later rival, Ed McMillan, who also actually did win a Nobel Prize in chemistry. Uh, Louis told me that back before World War II, people didn't know what physics was. But they knew what a chemist was, so that's how he introduced himself. Uh, th this is more of a typical photograph with him. Take a look at Louis Alvarez. He's doing two things that he taught me in the laboratory. One is he's wearing a short sleeve shirt because you don't want your sleeves touching things and getting caught in machinery. And the other is he has his hands in his pocket. He taught me that. He said, whenever you visit somebody else's laboratory, put your hands in your pocket. This will give them a reassurance that you're not going to touch things that you shouldn't be touching. Uh, I like the story about uh, spending the time thinking. Boy, was that a lesson he tried to get me to learn. Always spend some time thinking. I, would, I, he, he, I, I saw him doing this. I would walk in on typically Friday afternoons, and be sitting, he'd be sitting there at his desk not doing anything. So he was actually practicing what he preached. And sometimes he came up with the most extraordinary things. There was a leak in the Alaska pipeline. He invented a way to put a backscatter x-ray detector in the middle of the Alaska pipeline. I hadn't realized this was a problem worthy of attack by a physicist. But he never saw anything that wasn't worthy of attack. Uh, uh, this is uh, his mentor, Louis Alvarez, uh, I mean, mentor Ernest Lawrence with him at the 60-inch cyclotron. That's uh, Lawrence, third from the left. And Louis is up on the top. In many of the old photos, he found a unique place to put himself. Louis was, he taught me another lesson, which he called snooping. 
One time he asked me uh, whether I knew about this, what was going on in the next building. And I said, no. And he said, why not? I said, well, they had keep out signs. That stopped you? <laughs> well, I, uh, I <laughs> he said, let me teach you how to snoop. Come with me. So we went to that building with the keep out sign, and we walked past the keep out sign. We walked around, and someone came over and said, uh, can, can I help you? And Louis said, well, yes, uh, what, you look, what you're doing here looks really interesting. Is this an experiment to try to measure the electron mobility when you're doing sun bubble? Bub? And, and I said, well, yes, yes, it is. Uh, so Louis said, can you tell me more about it? And the guy started talking about it. And half an hour later, we were all best friends. It was really wonderful. I learned all about what was in this building. And, uh, and Louis said, if you are really interested in what other people are doing, and you, you, you show that interest, and you're somewhat knowledgeable and, and thoughtful, uh, it's the best way to learn what's going on. He expected me to snoop in every building at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory and know what was going on. I haven't really kept, kept that to the level that I think he wanted me to, but I think it was a great goal. <clears throat> uh, this is an old photo. It's in the program. I, it's kind of small. I don't have a high-resolution image. If someone does, I'd love to get it. Uh, it shows Louis' playfulness. In his youth, he loved limericks. Oh, he would, at any moment, he could tell me a limerick. He loved practical jokes. Let me tell you about a practical joke that he was really proud of. He was a student at Chicago, and there was this pompous teacher. You always play practical jokes on pompous teachers. And the pompous teacher was showing the Foucault's pendulum going back and forth. And it was right, and, and the, he brought all the students in. They set up the Foucault pendulum, and said, at the end of the lecture, we'll come back. Louis' lab was right next there. So what Louis did is he snuck out, and he got the Foucault pendulum, and he turned it one hour the wrong way. <laughs> and then he set up a thread, and it took about half an hour for the vibrations to damp out. And then just before the end of the lecture, he went and he burned the thread. Looks fine to me. It's a little purple, but that's the projector. That's not me. OK, and he burned the thread. And here's the thing swinging. And then he took great pleasure when the class came out. And the professor said, see, it's moved one hour, just like I said. And some student in the class said, professor, didn't you say it would go the other way? He said, no, no, this is the right way. This is the way it goes. See, you could use the right hand rule and so on. <laughs> of course, Louis, ne the essence of the supreme practical joke is you never reveal yourself. You never say anything. You never embarrass the person. You just make that person make a fool of himself. <laughs> In World War II, he was drawn first to, to work at the MIT Radiation Laboratory, where he invented all sorts of things. He invented actually the best radar, the best bomb site. It was better than the Norton, than the, than, than, than the Norton bomb site by far, as he loved to explain to me when you looked at the patterns of how far the Norton missed by and how far the Alvarez bomb site worked. His was, his was much, much better. But my favorite thing that he invented in World War II it was called Vixen. I just got to describe this to you. Okay, in radar, by the way, at the beginning of World War II, when he learned about radar, a professor friend of his came up and said, what's this thing? I hear you could bounce radio waves off things and it'll work. And Louis told me the right way to handle such information is not to say I can't tell you about that because that would basically prove that what had been said was really true. He felt his job was to convince the professor that radar was impossible which he then proceeded to do. This is how you get handle security in World War II. But one of the, it, 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 he basically said it's a one over R fourth. It takes one over R squared to get there. It bounces back one over R squared. Your signal goes as one over R to the fourth. And therefore, they will see you coming long before you get a signal back. Does no good. Well, it, it, of course, it does work, but that was his argument. And if you think about it, it's not easy to come over, overcome that. But he did something in World War II that is so nasty. I mean, if, if, if I, I shouldn't smile at this because it wound up killing Germans, and we don't smile when anybody gets killed. But I got to tell you this. Um, his idea was called VIX, and he got a patent on it. What he did is this. You're in an airplane, and the, the U-boats are sitting on the surface. They spend most of their time on the surface. You see them on radar. They see that your radar is hitting them. They watch your radar signal. As it gets stronger and stronger, they go under. And then it's too late. You can't do anything. So his idea was. As you get closer, and you know how far away you are because you have the range, you turn down the intensity as, as, as R cubed. Now, that means as you get closer, because it's one of R to the fourth, the signal will actually get stronger. The radar signal to you will actually get stronger. But the radar signal to the submariner, that's a one over R squared, because you're turning it down it's one over R cubed, it'll get weaker and weaker and weaker. It's a really clever, nasty thing. 
And so the radar, the guy on the submarine says, oh, I'm picking up radar from that airplane, but it's getting weaker. He must be moving away. And then the plane suddenly over him and boom. Uh, really clever, nasty, terrible thing. He also invented ground controlled approach. This was enormously important during World War II as a way of landing airplanes when it was completely fogged in. Initially, he called it you know, ground controlled landing. But the pilots didn't like that. They, no, they, they don't want anybody else controlling the landing. So he changed the name to ground controlled approach so that they would accept this. And then, of course, they would see the ground when they were 10 feet above it and they'd be able to land. Um, he told me that so many lives were saved by this method, this radar method, which involved actually thinking of radar as a diffraction pattern, uh, making, making with narrow side lobes. He thought it through using optics, which he loved. Uh, he, so many lives were saved in doing this that he said every, every year, someone, he'd bump into someone who would say, I've been looking for you, you're Louis Alvarez. In fact, a few years later, I was with Louis Alvarez and someone came up to him and said, are you Louis Alvarez? Yes, the guy who invented, invented ground control approach? Yes, I've been wanting to thank you for decades. You saved my life in World War II. I was a pilot, blankety blank. I was actually there, but he told me these things happened every year. People coming back and thanking him for basically being the first person to tell, to build a system. He went out there, he was there bringing these pilots in. He was actually out in England doing this. He got to meet all of them. And, and uh, it was a great achievement. He got the Collier Trophy, which was a big deal. Uh, he had his own division at MIT uh, for the ideas that he was having. Vixen, radar bomb site, all these things, uh, ground controlled approach. Uh, but then when the war in Europe was over, he went to Los Alamos. And he was given a job there. The first job was to figure out how to explode the, uh, the, the, the um, Nagasaki bomb. This was an implosion bomb using plutonium. You had all these, the, these high explosives. They were point, points where they would detonate them. But somehow this all had to come in. They had to be detonated truly simultaneously. And when they did it, they were off by microseconds. So Louis was asked to figure out how to solve the trigger problem. You want them to hit the same time within billionths of a second, not just within millionths of a second. And so the first thing he tried, he told me, worked, which was instead of hitting it with five volts, you hit it with 500 volts. And it really goes off right away every time. He <laughs> solved that problem. His next job was to, to uh, come up with a way of measuring the size of the explosion uh, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So he built a little device that there's a chase plane going along with the bomb plane. And as the bomb plane dropped its bomb, the chase plane would also turn around. At that point, it'd drop a, a little device on a parachute that would measure the blast, and that would measure the bomb. And, and so this was, uh, Louis was actually on the chase plane over Hiroshima when he threw this device overboard. Uh, and it correctly measured the blast, which was 13 kilotons. And the next day, uh, President Harry Truman announced that the bomb was 20 kilotons. And that's because pr President Truman was confusing the bomb test at Alamogordo with the one at, at Hiroshima. But, but anyway, uh, he, he did measure the blast that way. The second one, uh, he wasn't on the chase plane, but an assistant threw over the device and measured the uh, what would happen is they'd turn around, this thing's coming down, the blast wave would hit, it would radio back the signal for the strength of the blast wave. From that, they could get the size of the explosion. But Louis did something on that, which is sort of, oh, there's the submarines. Wait, I'm going the wrong way. Okay. He did something on that which is uh, notable. Uh, he and two of his colleagues decided that on, this, on the blast over uh, Nagasaki, they would attach a little note. They didn't clear this with anybody. They just attached the little note. Uh, and there it is. Uh, basically what the note, the, the real note is on the left. The transcript is on the right. Basically what it says, it's, a, it's directed to the top physicist, Professor Sagan of, 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 of Japan, who worked in nuclear physics, who had actually visited him at Berkeley. And it said, dear Professor Sagan, uh, you must alert your superiors that we now have the atomic bomb. We're shown, we've shown we're willing to use this. Please let them know that your entire country will be destroyed by, hydro, by, by atomic bombs uh, if, 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 if you don't surrender. 
And, and this note was found. And in fact, that's how Louis got it back. It was found and eventually returned to him. It was found, of course, by the, by, by the uh, Japanese and it never got to their emperor, uh, never got to Sagan, but it was read by their military. It may have had some effect on the, uh, by the way, at the time, we had no bombs left. Uh, he didn't mention that uh, in, his, in his note. When it came back to Berkeley, um, after the war, he knew that after so many years of working on war-related devices that he was no longer a, um, a, a, a physicist working in basic science. And he wanted to get back. So he did something that I think is enormously important, was a model for me, and, and maybe should be a model for you. He decided he would return as a graduate student. And he wasn't really a graduate student, he was a professor. But he spoke to three of his younger colleagues, Lynn Stevenson, Frank Crawford, and Bob Tripp, and asked them to treat him like a graduate student, to give him things to do, to test him on various things, until he came up to speed. Uh, I spoke to Lynn Stevenson some, a little while ago and asked him, uh, how that worked out, and he said, yeah, it took Louis about a month. <laughs> but this idea that you have to subvert your ego, you're new in a field. He used this with the dinosaurs, he did this with every field that he moved into, x-raying the pyramids, all of these things, every single one of them, the idea was you have to recognize being a graduate student means you're not the boss anymore. If you're going to change, and this is the key thing that so many people are unwilling to do. They, you go and you give talks and you are the esteemed speaker at the international conferences on your subject. How do you go from that to being a graduate student again in a new field? You have to want to do it. You have to be willing to do it. You have to be able to put up with the snide comments of the referees who say, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, even though you do. Or perhaps you don't know all the right references, all the work that came before. It's a hard thing to do. But he did it over and over again. I don't think there's any better lesson that if you really want to get into something brand new, you simply throw away your ego and you, you, get, you get used to being treated like a beginner again. But you're not a beginner. You're bringing in a wealth of knowledge from other fields. And that's the real key. That's how it really works. It's a photograph. Um, <laughs> I mean, what is he? Is, he? is he a physicist? Is he an engineer? Is his colleagues in the National Academy of Engineering undoubtedly think of him as a clever and daring engineer. Uh, he had a perfect safety record while building and operating the huge liquid hydrogen bubble chamber. Uh, here he is with the bubble chamber. Uh, not in typical dress. That's not what he wore when he was down at the, at the bubble chamber. Um, I've got to tell you a little story about the bubble chamber he, that, that he related to me. He came in one day and saw a safety man was putting up an alarm uh, that would detect leaking hydrogen and get everybody to evacuate. Alarm. He went up to the guy and said, how does this alarm notify us? Oh, there's a bell. How does the bell work? Well, it's just a bell. Does it have a clapper? Yes. Could you turn it on for me and we can see if there are little sparks where it breaks the current? <laughs> and they turned it on and it did. And he said, this would certainly alert everybody when there was a hydrogen leak. <laughs> but it was typical that he, would not, that he would not necessarily trust the safety of his work to the safety expert. He really wanted to check things himself. At the same time, he felt at times that, that he had to give the project over to an engineer and show that he was not second guessing the engineer because otherwise the engineer would not do as careful a job. If you know you're going to be second guessed, then you'll wait for your Louis Alvarez to find the, find the mistakes. Um, Louis was an entrepreneur. He started Humphrey Instruments, uh, Schwem Technologies. Uh, yeah, he named them after Bill Humphrey and, and Pete Schwem. Um, uh, and, um, he always delegated to his colleagues more, responsible, more responsibility than, he, than, than we were ready for. And it's sort of like raising a baby where you, you I have a grandchild now, almost two years old, and, and uh, she's, she's always surprising me, but he treated me like that little baby. Um, just as many of his protégés today are in the high-tech business world as are in the academic world. Because he saw both of those. Uh, we have Don Hammond here from, from Hewlett Packard. Don, Louis was so happy to be involved with Hewlett Packard and to help them develop their technology. Um, although 
Louis credited Lawrence with inventing big science. In the 1960s, his bubble chamber team was several hundred people strong. Um, one of them, his future wife-to-be, Jan Alvarez, was, was a scanner, I believe. It was the largest team in the world. Um, the, on his papers, there were sometimes a dozen authors. Uh, it, it, people thought the group was way too big, uh, but I, I, I really loved it in there. Um, it, it, the team was really responsible for the vast growth in the number of known uh, subnuclear particles. In, in the photo here, Louis is sitting in the middle. You see him there. Up to the left is Lynn Stevenson. And if you look hard, you'll see Art Rosenfeld, just to Louis's left, I believe, to the right, as you see it. Uh, this is a nice one. Stan, these people are here, <laughs> except for Louis, uh, Stan Wojcicki and Philippe Eberhardt. It's amazing how they haven't changed one bit over the years. <laughs> Little throwaway thing. Years later, I got involved in using tandem accelerators, a kind of Van de Graaff accelerator. Uh, it, it's, it's used around the world. It is the most common type of multiple MEV, not GEV, but MEV accelerators used for nuclear physics. It was Louis Alvarez's invention. For anybody else in the world, this would be the highlight of their career. People forget that Louis Al I mean, the idea is simple. You have, a, you, have, you, have a, you have 10 minutes, you have a particle coming along and has negative charge, and it's being accelerated, and then you run it through a thin foil, and the negative charge is stripped off. Now it has positive charge. Well, if it was accelerated this way for negative charge, it'll be accelerated back down for, neg you get double the energy. It was really a wonderful, wonderful thing. Here he is in the Great Pyramids of, 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 of Egypt. Uh, his project, which I think we'll hear about later on today, about x-raying the pyramids, Jerry Lynch was associated with that, um, is, is, uh, is really a wonderful case of, I think, a childhood dream coming true. When he, when he was growing up, he heard all about the pyramids. and and. He came up with this idea of you as using muons to x-ray them. You'll hear more about that. But let me just, because you'll hear more about it, let me just tell a little story, which is that uh, a fellow working for him, Buck Buckingham, who I remember quite well, uh, did a little ancillary experiment that I still tell people about, and it's hardly known at all. But back in those days, uh, there, were, there were people who believed if you put things in pyramids, if you slept in a pyramid tent, you would live longer. You put wine in pyramids, it, it ages better. All sorts of good things happen when you put, so Buck, what he did is he got a, a razor blade, he used razor blade, had it uh, scanned with an electron microscope, and then he put it right in the heart of the Great Pyramid. And he left it there for a few weeks and took it out and then had more measurements made on it again. It turns out, boy, if you think a little tent pyramid on your bed is going to do something or a little pyramid on your wine, what about the Great Pyramid? Well, it had no effect whatsoever on the sharpness of that razor blade. <laughs> I just want to mention, here am I. I haven't changed either. Uh, so Louis became my, my mentor. It played an enormous role in my life. Doesn't mean I always took his advice. Uh, on the right is a memo that I wrote back in 1972, 73, it's dated 73, uh, that Louis thought was a project not worth doing. I told him that I wanted to measure the anisotropy of the cosmic radiation using microwaves, that I thought this was a doable and interesting experiment, and he said, no, Rich, I think it's a waste of time. He said, you're not going to find anything. There will be nothing there. It's a bad bet. You're going to find the uh, radiation is absolutely uniform. Well, I persisted. Uh, and and he, he was, you know, he said, well, you know, if you go ahead if you think it's important, but I don't. Um, then one day I went and showed him, you know, even if we discover nothing, we'll see the fact that the Earth is moving. We'll see what used to be called the ether drift, because there'll be a cosine anisotropy. It'll be hotter on one side than on the other. And his reaction was, wow, that's really interesting. OK, you will have something. Let me help you raise money for this. He took me in to see Bob Burge. And the next thing you know, Bob said, well, as long as the, you keep the project really little, uh, so it, it's, it's not a significant part of the physics division budget. You know, I could afford to give you one full-time engineer and one full-time technician to help you with this, but not more than about $100,000 worth of funding. Things were a little bit different back in those days. That's how the project spawned. George, George Smoot, actually, an interesting story about George. I still remember this rather vividly. So I started up this project, and I, and, one, and I think George would be the perfect person to work on this project. So I go over to George, and I say, George, you know about the project on the cosmic microwaves that I'm doing? He says, yes. I said, 
would you be interested in working on it? He looked up at me and said, yes. <laughs> no bargaining, no haggling, no whatever. So he, he joined the team. And, and eventually, that was, of course, the thing that George then took up to a satellite in Kobe. And, and deservedly, he won the Nobel Prize for that. There's the dinosaur thing. Um, I say I have five minutes left. So uh, you'll hear a lot more about the dinosaurs. Uh, I, this, this is such a wonderful story. What a, what a great legacy uh, uh, for that project. Here he is with his son, Walter, who you'll see also hasn't changed at all. Uh, the, the pyramid thing uh, got this uh, cartoon uh, in, the, uh, in, in the Sunday comics. And uh, I, I, I love this thing. I, I, I got to know the person who did this, Athel Sand Spillhouse, and he sent me an original copy, which I now have. Uh, and I like to think in that lower right-hand column, there's this explorer who's going in there and looking with a flashlight. And I like to think that that's, that's Louis Alvarez. Uh, uh, so uh, let, let me, oh, at, at lunch, Louis was always really happy that he was surrounded by young physicists. He used to make fun, I won't mention the names, but they were the, he'd point to the other older physicists uh, at the lab and how they were sitting with each other. He said, telling old stories about the good old days, whereas he was always working with young people and he was proud of that. Here he is with my daughter. Uh, that's Elizabeth, by the way. Uh, he would put her on a knee and, and say, this is the way the ladies ride. Boom, ba, boom, ba, boom, ba, boom. This is the way the cowboys ride. Boom, ba, boom. Anyway, now Elizabeth does that with her daughter, my granddaughter. Louis loved to fly. I think my one way I disappointed Louis Alvarez was I never caught the fire of wanting to fly my own airplane. I think it was a dream of his. Again, growing up, born around 1910, I, uh, that, that, you know, flying an airplane was really such an exciting thing to do. And to me, um, no. Uh, but I think I disappointed him in that. Uh, Louis was a great nominator. And uh, this, we're, we're getting near the end. <laughs> I, I, I certainly benefited from this. But, but I would walk into his office more often than not. He was nominating someone to be a member of the Academy to get a prize or something like that. Uh, you know, I certainly benefited a lot from that. Uh, for, the, for the discovery of the cosmic anisotropy, uh, Louis nominated me to win the Texas Instruments Prize and also the Waterman Prize, and I also got on the faculty uh, thanks to that. But, but it never would have happened except Louis was doing this. It was his way of paying people back, I guess. Or uh, One time I asked him, how can I repay him? He said, well, when you're in a position, you nominate people too. So how would Louis Alvarez remember Louis Alvarez? He's an engineer, he's an entrepreneur, he's an adventurer, which way? I think the way he would remember himself is this image. He believed he had inherited the, 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 the quest of the great explorers, uh, of Captain Cook, who he would tell me about in detail, about the English explorer, you know, uh, uh, Sir Richard Burton, who he really admired, the first non-Muslim to penetrate and explore the secrets of the Kaaba in Mecca. Uh, he was familiar with the journals of the great explorers, uh, the last place on the earth, the South Pole, was reached in 1911, the year he was born. Uh, but the mysteries of the 20th and now the 21st century were no longer in geography, but in science. He went after these mysteries with the same enthusiasm, excitement, and sense of wonder, adventure, and determination that had driven the explorers of the earth. He spent his life trying to put together a map of this unknown world. Uh, particularly in the more, near the end of his life when working on the mass extin extinctions, which were about as far as he ever got from his, uh, uh, from, 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 from his uh, line of experience. Uh, uh, he, he suffered the same hardships as the great explorers. And, and any time you enter a field, you, you'll recognize this. Shortages of supplies and attacks by the natives. <laughs> but he was willing to put up with both of those. Uh, and uh, I will always remember Louis Alvarez, this is my last slide, as the man who loved thinking above all else, always thinking. Uh, one out of 10 of uh, ideas, he said, were worth pursuing, only one out of 10. He would, uh, re he would throw out nine of those before he even mentioning to, to anybody else. Uh, one out of 10 would be, would, would possibly uh, be important. He would then share these with someone like me or, or, or the Alvarez group, um, and then uh, they would be dismissed too. So one out of a hundred or something that he felt might lead to a discovery. 
uh, if these figures are true, then imagine how many ideas Louis had. I, I believe those numbers. I, I believe they were, they were thousands of ideas, most of which uh, were, 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 were never got anywhere. Uh, so I, I will remember him as a great teacher, someone who wanted to pass on this legacy. And, and again, I remind you in this talk, in this present, in, in this day, that the most wonderful thing you can do is try to figure out how he did it because it was a life of adventure and, and a life that I think uh, many of us admire and would love to emulate. Thank you very much.